Hi there, Stark County Elementary students. Today we are going to begin the book The Mouse and the Motorcycle by Beverly Cleary. Coincidentally, Beverly Cleary's birthday was just April 12th, which was about uh, a week ago. And um, she would have turned 104. So I guess we're kind of reading one of her books in celebration of her birthday. I hope you enjoy this. It's an old one, but it's a good one. Um, and we will read The Mouse and the Motorcycle by Beverly Cleary. We're going to start today. Chapter one, the new guests. Keith, the boy in the rumpled shorts and shirt, did not know he was being watched as he entered room 215 of the Mountain View Inn. Neither did his mother and father, who both looked hot and tired. They had come from Ohio, and for five days they had driven across plains and deserts and over mountains to the old hotel in the California foothills, foothills 25 miles from Highway 40. The fourth person, person entering room 215 may have, been, may have known he was being watched, but he did not care. He was Matt, 60 if he was a day, who at the moment was the bellboy. Matt also replaced worn-out light bulbs, renewed washers and leaky faucets, carried trays for people who telephoned room service to order food, and he sent it to their rooms, and sometimes prevented children from hitting one another with croquet mallets on the lawn behind the hotel. Now Matt's right shoulder sagged with the weight of one of the bags he was carrying. Here you are, Mr. Gridley, rooms 215 and 16, he said setting the smaller of the bags on a luggage rack at the foot of the double bed before he opened the door to the next room. I expect you and Mr. Gridley will want room 216. It's a corner room with twin beds and a private bath. He carried a heavy bag into the room where he could be heard opening windows. Outside, a chipmunk chattered in a pine tree and a chickadee whistled. Beep, 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 beep. The boy's mother looked critically around the room 215 and whispered, I think we should drive back to the main highway. There must be a hotel with a vacancy sign someplace. We didn't look long enough. Not another mile, answered the father. I am not driving another mile on a California highway on a holiday weekend. Did you see the way that truck almost forced us off the road? Dad, did you see those two fellows on motorcycles? Began the boy and he stopped, realizing he should not interrupt an argument. But this place is so old, protested the boy's mother, and we have only three weeks for our whole trip. We had planned to spend the 4th of July weekend in, San, weekend in San Francisco, and we wanted to show Keith as much of the United States as we could. San Francisco will have to wait, and this is part of the United States. Besides, this used to be a very fashionable hotel, said Mr. Gridley. People came from miles around. Well, 50 years ago, said Mrs. Gridley, and they came by horse and buggy. The bellboy returned to room 215. The dining room opens at 6.30, sir. There is a ping pong table game. Uh, there is a ping pong in the game room, TV in the lobby, and croquet on the back lawn. I'm sure you'll be very comfortable. Matt, who has seen guests come and go for many years, knew that there were two kinds, those who thought the hotel was a dreadful old barn of a place and those who thought it was charming and quaint, so quiet and restful. Of course we will be comfortable, said Mr. Gridley, dropping some coins into Matt's hand for carrying the bags. But this big old hotel is positively spooky, Miss Gridley made one last protest. It's probably full of mice. Matt opened the window wide. Mice? Oh, no, ma'am. The management wouldn't stand for mice. I wouldn't mind a few mice, the boy said as he looked around the room at the high ceiling and the knotty pine walls, the carpet so threadbare that it had many of its roses almost entirely faded, and one chair with an, with an anti-mask car on its back and a wash basin and towel racks in the corner of the room. I like it here, he announced. A whole room to myself. Usually I get the cot by the corner of the motel room. His mother smiled, relenting. She turned to Matt. I'm sorry, it's just that it was just so hot crossing Nevada, and we're not used to mountain driving, and back on the highway, the traffic was bumper to bumper. I'm sure we will, shall be, we will be very comfortable. After Matt had gone, closing the door behind him, Mr. Gridley said, I need a rest before dinner. 400 miles of driving, that mountain traffic, it was too much. And if we're going to stay for the weekend, I'd better unpack, said Miss Gridley. At least I'll have a chance to do some drip drying. Alone in the room two, of 215, unaware that he was being watched, the boy began to explore. He got down on his hands and knees and looked under the bed. He leaned out the window as far as he could and greedily inhaled the deep breaths of pine-scented air. He turned on the hot and cold water 
in the bait wash basin and slipped one of the bars of paper wrapped soap into his pocket. Under the window, he discovered a knot hole in the pine wall down by the floor and squatting, he poked his finger into the hole. When he felt nothing inside, he lost interest. Next, Keith opened his suitcase and took out an apple and several small cars, a sedan, a sports car, and an ambulance about six inches long and a red motorcycle, half the length of the cars, which he dropped onto the striped bedspread before he bit into the apple. He ate the apple noisily in big chomping bites. And then he laid the core on the bedside table between the lamp and the telephone. Keith began to play, running his cars up and down the bedspread, pretending that the stripes on the spread were highways and making noises with his mouth. Vroom, vroom for the sports car. Whee, whee for the ambulance. And bub, 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 for the motorcycle up and down the stripes. Once Keith stopped suddenly and he looked around the room as if he expected to see something or someone. When he saw nothing unusual, he reached it. He returned to his cars. Vroom, vroom, bang, crash. The sports car hit the sedan and rolled off the highway stripe. Bub, 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 bub. The police car came roaring to the scene of the crash. Keith, his mother called from the next room. Time to get washed up for dinner. Okay. Keith parked his cars in a straight line on the bedspread table, bedside table, beside the telephone where they looked like a row of real cars, only much, much smaller. The first thing Mrs. Gribbley noticed, Gridley noticed when she and Mr. Gridley came into the room was the apple core on the table. She dropped it with a thunk into the metal waste can beside the table as she gave several quick sniffs of the air and said, looking perplexed, I don't care what that bellboy says. I'm sure this hotel has mice. Well, I hope so, muttered Keith. Chapter 2 the motorcycle. Except for one terrifying moment when the boy had poked his finger through the mouse hole, a hungry young mouse named Ralph eagerly watched everything that went on in room 215. At first he was disappointed at the size of the boy who was to occupy the room. A little child, preferably two or even three children, would have been better. Little messy children were always were always considered considerate about leaving crumbs on the carpet. Oh well, at least these people did not have a dog. If it was one thing Ralph disliked, it was a dog. Next, Ralph felt hopeful. Medium-sized boys could always, almost always be counted on to leave a sticky candy bar wrapper on the floor or a bag of peanuts by the bedside table where Ralph could reach them by climbing up the telephone cord. With a boy this size, his food, though not apt to be plentiful, was sure to be of good quality. The third emotion Ralph felt was joy when the boy had laid the apple core by the telephone. This was followed by despair when the mother dropped the core into the metal basket. Ralph knew that knew that anything at the bottom of a metal waste basket was lost and gone forever to a mouse. A mouse lives not by crumbs alone, and so Ralph experienced still yet another emotion. This time, food was not the cause of it. Ralph was eager and excited and curious and impatient all at once. The emotion was so strong it made him forget his empty stomach. It was caused by those little cars, especially that motorcycle, and the bub 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 sound the boy made. That sound seemed to satisfy something within Ralph, as if he had been waiting all of his life to hear it. Bub 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 went the boy. To the mouse, the sound spoke of highways and speed, of distance and danger, of whiskers blown back by the wind. The instant the family left the room to go to dinner, Ralph scurried out of the mouse hole and across the threadbare carpet to the telephone cord, which came out of a hole in the floor beside the bedside table. Ralph scolded his mother from the mouse hole. You stay away from that telephone cord. Ralph's mother was a great worrier. She worried because their hotel was old and run down, and because so many rooms were often left empty with no careless guests to leave crumbs behind for mice. She was worried about the rumor that their motel was to be torn down when the highway came through. She worried about her children finding aspirin tablets. Ralph's father had tried to carry an aspirin tablet in his cheek pouch, and the aspirin had dissolved with unexpected suddenness, and Ralph's father had been poisoned. Since then, no member of the family would think of touching an aspirin family tablet, but this did not prevent Ralph's mother from worrying. Most of all, Ralph's mother worried about Ralph. She worried because he was a reckless mouse who stayed out late in the daytime when he should have been home safe in bed. She worried when Ralph climbed the curtain to sit in the windowsill to watch the chipmunk in the pine tree outside and the cars in the parking lot below. She worried because Ralph wanted to go exploring down the hall instead of traveling under the floorboards like a sensible mouse. Heaven only knew what dangers might meet in the hall. Maids, bellboys, perhaps even cats. Or, what was worse, a vacuum cleaner. Ralph's mother had heard horror stories of vacuum cleaners. Ralph, 
who was used to his mother's worries, got a good running start and was already halfway up the telephone cord. Remember your Uncle Victor, his mother called after him. Ralph seemed not to hear. He climbed the cord up to the telephone, jumped down, and ran around the row of cars. There it was on the end, the motorcycle. Ralph stared at it, and he walked over and kicked a tire. Close up, the motorcycle looked even better than he expected. It was new and shiny and had a lot of had a good set of tires. Ralph walked all the way around it, examining a pair of chrome mufflers and the engine and the hand clutch, and even the little license plate so it would have be legal to ride it. Boy, said Ralph to himself, his whiskers quivering with excitement. Boy, oh boy, feeling that this was an important moment in his life, he took hold of the hand grips. They felt good and solid beneath his paws. Yes, this motorcycle was a good machine, all right. He could tell by the feel. Ralph grew, threw a leg over the motorcycle and sat jauntily on the plastic seat. He even bounced up and down. The seat was curved just right to fit a mouse. But how to start the motorcycle? Ralph did not know. And even if he did know how to start it, he could not do much riding up here on the bedside table. He considered pushing it, the motorcycle off onto the floor, but he did not want to risk damaging such a valuable machine. Ralph bounced up and down on the seat a couple more times and he looked around for some way to start the motorcycle. He pulled out a lever or two, but nothing happened. And then a terrible thought spoiled his pleasure. Well, this was only a toy. It would not run at all. Ralph, who had watched many children in rooms 215, had picked up a lot of information about toys. He had seen a boy from Cedar Rapids throw his model airplane onto the floor because he could not make its plastic parts fit properly. A little girl had burst into tears and run sobbing to her mother when her doll's arm had come off its, out of its socket. And then there was that nice boy, the potato chip nibbler, who stomped his foot because the batteries kept falling out of his car. This toy could not be like those other toys he had seen. It looked too perfect with its wire spokes and its wheels and a pair of shiny chrome uh, exhaust pipes. It would not be right if it did not run. It would not be fair. A motorcycle that looked this real had to run. The secret of making it run must be perfectly simple if only Ralph had someone to show him what it was. Ralph was not satisfied just sitting on the motorcycle. Ralph craved action. After all, what was a motorcycle if it was not action? Who needed motorcycle riding lessons? Not Ralph. He tried pushing himself along with his feet. This was not nearly fast enough, but it was better than nothing. He moved his feet faster along the table, and he lifted them up while he coasted. Feeling braver, he bent over the handlebars and worked his feet still faster toward the edge of the bedside table. And when he'd worked up a little speed, he would coast around the corner. He scrambled scrabbled his feet on the table to gain momentum in a split section he would second he would steer to the left at that moment the bell on the telephone rang half a ring so close that it seemed to pierce the middle of ralph's bones it rang that just half ring as if the girl on the switchboard realized she had rung the wrong room and had jerked the cord before the ring was finished that half a ring was enough it shattered ralph's nerves it terrified him so that he forgot all about steering it jumbled his thoughts until he forgot to drag his heels for brakes he was so terrified he let go of the hand grips the moment the momentum of the motorcycle carried him forward and over the edge of the table down down through the space tumbled ralph with the motorcycle he tried to straighten out to turn the fall into a leap but the motorcycle got in his way and he grabbed in vain at the air with both of his paws. There was nothing to clutch, nothing to save him, only the empty air. For a fleeting instant, he thought of his poor Uncle Victor. That was the instant that the motorcycle landed with a crash in the metal wastebasket. Ralph fell in a heap beside the motorcycle and lay still. Here's Ralph when he was falling on the motorcycle. And that's where we will stop for today. And tomorrow we will pick up chapter three of The Mouse and the Motorcycle by Beverly Cleary.